Uh, I've had the pleasure of knowing Simone and Jonathan Anderson for several years now. Uh, Simone is like a sister to me. We went on some missions trips together with Joanne Moody. And then she called me one day and said, Brandon, there's this guy I want you to meet. And I was suspicious about this guy. I said, don't worry, Simone. I will grill him. I'm going to grill this man and make sure he's uh, ready for the task. And, uh, and he was. He's, he's such a gift. They run the YWAM base in Kansas City. And for us, one of our key values here at the church is mission. And we really want to give missionaries the ability to share what God's doing around the globe. We can get so isolated in our Roseville bubble and Sacramento bubble that all we think about is the, pol the politics that are here locally or your job or what's happening maybe you see on the news. God is doing things, church, around the globe. He is, doing, he is moving in power. See, if you just watch the news, you have no grid as to what God is actually doing inside the globe. And I just, a couple weeks back, I started hearing the testimonies of Simone and Jonathan. They said, you know what? We're traveling some churches right now. I'm like, you're coming here. You need to come here and deposit what God is doing in you uh, right now through global missions and also local missions. So would you welcome my good friend, Jonathan Anderson, as he shares this morning. Give it up for Jonathan. Look at this little... Look at this little little twinsy action. There it is. <laughs> we, uh, we planned out our outfits yesterday for this morning. Yeah, going back to uh, the story that Brandon just mentioned, the, uh, when Simone and I were uh, talking to each other about four years ago, I called her father, and I'm one of six kids. I have four sisters, and I saw my dad talk to all the men in those four sisters' lives. And uh, he's a little intense. He's kind of an intense personality himself. Um, but I was ready for that when I stepped into a relationship. So early on with Simone, I called her father just, hey, we're in a relationship. Is, you know, can I have your blessing, et cetera? And on the call, he literally breaks down crying, almost hands her to, mar to, to me in marriage right there on the spot as we're dating. And so I was like, wow. I hung up. And I was like, that was way easier than I thought. And then I got on a phone call with uh, Brandon and I got the real conversation in that. In that. <laughs> so I appreciate it. Actually, I appreciate it because I was ready for it. I was waiting for somebody to make sure that I was legit enough to marry Simone. So I appreciate it. Simone has been uh, connected to this house and to Sacramento for a number of years. I'm a little bit newer. So I was introducing myself to a few people this morning. And uh, it doesn't actually matter if you know my name. You can just call me Simone's husband. That's fine. That works. Or Axel or Ava's dad. That works as well. Um, but I know a lot of people have known Simone in and out. And so she's, she has been very blessed by this community over the years. And therefore, I have been very blessed by this community over the years. I know we were just talking yesterday. And she was saying how, particularly in the prophetic She's, she was saying she's been activated in that category from this community in a very profound way. And so that's an inheritance that you guys have, you guys carry, is walking in the prophetic. Sure enough, as soon as I walked in this morning, I was, I was talking to a couple of guys. They're prophesying over me. I was like, I would expect nothing less. <laughs> expect nothing less. That was amazing. I'll receive all those words. Um, so we are super blessed to be with you guys, and we believe in this community. We believe in what God's doing in this community, and we've already been blessed by it. So it's just our joy to, to share a little bit with you here this morning. Hopefully it's encouraging. So a little background. I think I just saw my family was on the screen here. A little background about us real quick. Uh, those are our two little kids. So Axel is there on the left. Well, I guess he's on both sides. Um, he's two years old, and he is very active. If you left him in this church by himself, he would explore every part of the church on its own, on his own, and would not be scared at all. He's a little adventurer. His middle name means messenger, and that's exactly what he is. And then we had little Ava. She's almost one. She is a cutie. And I knew Girls were different from boys whenever she was just a couple months old, two, three, four months old, and she, she batted her eyelashes at me. Different than Axel. Axel has never done that his entire life. She did it, and I paused. I go, wow, it is going to be different. It is going to be different. So uh, there's our family, uh, cute little family, I think at least. And uh, our family just recently got back from South Africa uh, a couple weeks ago. So yeah, so here's a couple photos from that. And we really enjoy doing family on mission together. And that's one of the things the Lord early on, we're like, we're going to do a lot of this stuff together. And so we took our whole family over there. And uh, it was a 16-hour flight, the long leg. 
once we got there, it was amazing. The journey there was a little bit interesting, but um, this is a little snapshot of what God's doing there. We worked in some of the townships. We were serving a brand new missions community there as well, and all the incredible work that they're doing. One of the things they're doing, I'll mention, is specifically with oral Bible translation. So I don't know if anybody's ever heard of that before, so it's kind of unique. Yeah, a few of you guys. And so there's 7,000 languages in the world, and there's a number of languages that are written languages, but then there's this whole category of them that are not, they don't even have an alphabet. So they don't have an alphabet, so they don't have a written language. Everything's oral to oral, and that's how they pass down history. That's how they do all of that. And so Bible translators have had trouble through the years of how do we reach these oral languages, these people groups. And so that uh, community right there in South Africa, they've taken it on for the continent of Africa. They're like, we are going to spearhead oral Bible translation in the continent of Africa. And so talking to them, interacting with them. Um, they have some open doors there in Uganda and South Sudan, a bunch of refugees, and they already have, I think, seven languages with people that are going to help do the oral-to-oral -oral Bible translation there on the ground, which is super awesome. And so a lot, again, Bible uh, uh, ministries have had trouble with this for years because normally the process is you have to write an alphabet you then have to educate the people, and then you translate the Bible and, and educate them in the Bible. That process can take decades, decades. So instead of waiting for that whole process to take place before you can actually disciple someone, you just do the oral-to-oral -oral translation first. Therefore, discipleship can already start as that process goes on. So that's what we were doing there in South Africa. It was really fun. And uh, now a couple weeks later, we're here in the Rock of Roseville in California. So we're pumped, pumped to be with you guys here. And uh, a little bit more on our story, just because some of you guys uh, might not know uh, about Simone or I. Um, I was 17 years old when I was first marked for missions, and it ruined me forever. And more than even marked for missions, marked for being missional in my life, wherever I am, whatever I'm doing. I remember I was 17 years old. I was in Mexico City, and we were at the Virgin of Guadalupe, which is the center for all of Catholicism in Latin America. And I remember there was a, a, a guy there who had been hit by a train, actually, and had not walked in seven years. So this is when I was 17 years old, okay? I didn't I had a lot of fear of man in my life at that time, even though I was a pastor's kid, missionary kid. So I couldn't hardly share Jesus with anyone, like even a Christian. I could hardly talk to them about Jesus if I was being honest. But in that uh, season of my life, God was setting me free from that. And I remember we prayed for this guy. And as we prayed for him a week, I don't even know what words I prayed, a uh, moment, and this guy stood up and walked. And I remember seeing him walk. And I remember in that moment, I was like, you know what? I'm going to do this for the rest of my life. And God really marked me. And Simone has a very similar story. When she was 15 years old, she was in an accident. And this accident caused her where the doctors were saying she might not ever be able to walk again. And she prayed all through the night. She had a lot of people in her town that were praying for her. She ended up being totally healed. And out of that experience, she ended up in Uganda and in Uganda, she saw God move through her as a teenager in a really powerful way. And now God's all the way full circle. And literally two weeks ago, this is our very first time. She almost moved to Uganda prior to us getting married. And then this is our first time back in Africa. And sure enough, there's connections there with Uganda and South Sudan. And so God is moving all around the world. And I'm not sharing our stories just because we're something special. We're just normal people teaching our kids how to, we're doing potty training right now with our two-year-old. This is real life, right? We are normal people, but God wants to use every single one of you here in this room in a powerful way right where you're at. And so I believe that. And um, anyway, so can I just pray for a second? Is that okay as we jump in? Because I, I have, yeah, some things that I really have felt on my heart even this morning in prayer that I wanted to share with you guys. So Lord, here we are this morning. Father, I thank you that you see every single person in this room. I thank you you see our hearts. I thank you you see the original design that you have for every single one of us. Father, I thank you you see 
the prophetic storyline of this community, of this city. And Lord, that you have a plan and a purpose for every person in this room and for this community. And so, Lord, this morning I ask, whatever you want deposited, we give you full permission to do it. Holy Spirit, we give you full permission to move and convict and impart everything you want to this morning. And we just say we love you and we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. So speaking of South Africa, when I was there, uh, I actually had a dream about here. So I was, I was there, wasn't thinking about this trip, and I had a dream literally of this Sunday morning of me preaching. This is not normal for me, by the way. I'm not, I don't have dreams every day of my life like some, some of you guys here have dreams probably every day of your life. I know you guys do. Um, but I had a dream literally of this uh, service, and I was in the dream. I was sharing things. Um, I don't know if you've ever had a dream where there's stuff happening, and you kind of just know the theme of what's happening, not necessarily the specific words. And I knew as I was sharing, what was happening was it was fanning the flame of words that have been spoken over this house. And so anytime I have a dream like that, I just pay attention a little extra. (laughs) And I know God wants to do something very specific this weekend. So coming in, both of us were like, God wants to do something really specific. And I could get up here and share just mission stories for the entire morning. That would be awesome. And if you want to hear more, I'd love to connect with you after. But uh, specifically, when we were talking, and Simone hit it off yesterday, I think, with that women's group, was there's something the Lord's highlighting in this community, specifically with mothering and fathering spiritually the next generation. And so I know yesterday, the women had a wild time. She's sharing a little bit, but it sounded like the Lord was moving on people's hearts. People were reconciling with one another, and there was a commitment that came forth from both those that were older, both those that were younger, that we need each other and we need to do this together. Amen? And so I know that was a moment yesterday and I know that's just the beginning of that moment among that group of women. And I feel like God wants to take that one layer deeper here this morning. Okay? So I want to talk specifically about mothering and fathering and the need for that in this next hour. Does that sound good to everybody? Okay, so, because there is, there is a crisis happening right now. It's, obviously, you have Ukraine, you have wars happening, you have pandemics, you've got all these things happening. I'm not talking about those crises, though. One of the crises that's happening right now, live time, is a crisis Paul talked about back in the New Testament in the book of Corinthians. So I think we have a slide on this, but Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15, Paul is addressing a church in Corinth. This church is pretty messed up. If you were to choose, yeah, some of you guys have studied it. If you were to choose one of the New Testament churches that's maybe the most dysfunctional and, and dealing with some of the strongest cultural opposition, the church in Corinth might be that church you'd pick. And so in the midst of that, Paul is speaking to them, and he says this, For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. He says, though you might have a lot of teachers, people that are teaching the word, these different things, you have very few spiritual parents. He's hitting on this, and he says, And he talks about himself, the next phrase, saying, I'm one of those. And then he begins to speak into them with a unique authority that only a spiritual father can do. And right now, today, more than ever, you could pull up your favorite sermons on a podcast, on YouTube. There's so many different forms of Bible apps out there. I can't even keep track of them. There's so many resources and teaching resources that are out there, which are all amazing, and we probably even need more of them. But where are the fathers? Where are the mothers? Where are the ones that are truly getting in the family of God in a nitty-gritty way and investing? 
I know there's some in this house, but I feel like God wants to take it to a whole nother level and take it deeper. Even, I'll speak specifically in uh, the mission that we're a part of. So we're a part of YWAM, Youth of the Mission. And right now, there's a global conversation happening. There's a gap in YWAM right now. You've got Lauren Cunningham, who was the founder of YWAM, and he's 86, 87 years old now. The guy's been to every country and territory on the planet. <laughs> Pretty crazy. Probably the most traveled person in human history, actually. And he just decided in the last couple of years, because of health and other things, he's not traveling anymore. And so now there's open conversation within our mission saying, what does life look like when our fathers move on? And there's this gap. So you've got 70s and 80s, the ones that pioneered the mission, and there's almost nobody in our mission that's 60s, 50s, 40s. It jumps all the way down to me, who's 30. <laughs> and I'm looked at, even with our, in our community in Kansas City, we have probably four or five couples total that are above 50 or 60, and then it's me and Smell. <laughs> People coming to us asking us about parenting and how does your how did your kids turn out so well? Our kids are two years old. I have no idea. How they, I hope they turn out amazing. <laughs> like it's it's kind of hilarious sometimes. Simone gives advice freely. I hesitate a little more. So I'm like, hey, talk to us in 15 years, 20 years when our kids are doing amazing. Um, but for real, we find ourselves in the middle of these conversations with all these young couples, all these 18, 20, 22 year olds who are who came from a lot of dysfunctional families for the most part, and they're looking for guidance. They're looking for someone to come and father them or mother them. And we're doing our best, but again, I feel like even right now, there is a need. The need in this hour, one of the needs in this hour is a or spirit filled, on fire, anchored in truth, mothers and fathers. Whether you're 70 years old pouring into people younger or you're 25 pouring into a 20-year-old, we need all of, you, all of you in the house to step up and actually grab a hold of it. Because the version of Christianity, is it okay if I'm just honest and kind of raw with you guys here this morning? I don't actually travel and do uh, speaking gigs that much in other circles other than YWAM. So I'm used to just kind of being raw and unfiltered, so that's my only version, really. So if, I, if it's a little much for you, Brandon won't invite me back, and it's fine. It's okay. We'll still be friends. <laughs> so anyway, so I'm just going to be real and just go there because I, I'm going to say the version of Christianity from 10 years ago is not going to make it for this next generation now. The version they had even five years ago, maybe in some ways, is not going to cut it with what this next generation is dealing with. The things that they're being hit with from all sides, that we're all being hit with from all sides, is intense. The cultural battlegrounds that they find themselves in from all angles is intense. And I'm actually just going to hit a few of them right now because I was writing some down this morning. Just to go there, right? So the amount of sexual perversion and different things that are hitting this community is intense. There, it used to be back in the day, if you wanted to see images you shouldn't see, you'd have to get in a car, go to a store, buy a magazine, hide it, do it that way. You'd have to go out of your way to see something you shouldn't. Today, we have eight-year-olds with devices that are one click away from the same thing. And actually, they don't even mean to. It comes at them. I've had so many conversations with guys through the years, and more so recently than ever, is they didn't even want this, and it just came at them, and they had no one to go to with it. They were hit with shame, and they didn't have a close enough spiritual parent near them to journey with them in it, so they got stuck in it for years until they finally got free. So the amount of this garbage that's being pushed at this next gen is so intense. If someone's not walking with them, it's going to take them out. It's going to take them out. That's just one category. Here's a whole other category. Uh, there's a, actually a group of our staff. This is going to sound funny to you, but 
that are ministering to people on the platform of TikTok. And the reason why we're on there is not because I like it, I hate it <laughs> personally, but I had someone showing me these videos on TikTok where when there's a, a, a young person who's hungry for some spiritual truth or something, and a lot of them are, they search Christian or Jesus or whatever, all of the top videos are these compromised preachers. All these top videos are, t are telling them why you can still sleep with your boyfriend, and it's fine. They're telling them why they can be one foot in the world and one foot in with Jesus. And so I remember I was seeing some of these videos, or gosh, like, I I'm, I'm holding back right now, but there's, there's so much on there. When I, when I was seeing those different videos, like, man, we have to engage this sphere. Because the, the hungry 15-year-old that's looking for genuine truth, when they're searching, they're finding a version of Christianity that's not in the Bible. Yeah. They're finding a version that has a bunch of holes in it because someone has taken scissors to the parts that they don't like. Right? When it's not convenient, they cut it out. And it's even biblical topics or words or phrases are redefined to mean something totally different. And so our guys have been engaging on there, and there's so many hungry people, but the version of half in, half out is the version that most people are getting these days. Most people are getting that version. And the only version that's going to satisfy is the all-in Jesus version that he gave, where if he, he said, if you want to follow me, you must take up your cross, deny yourself, and follow me. He says, actually, if you want to find true life, you have to lose your life to find true life. And most of the time, these guys are seeing Jesus as an add-on. They're seeing him as, I'm, I'm going through my life. I have a few problems. I have some struggles going on. I need some kind of religion. So they find a sprinkle of Jesus sprinkle it in their life, an hour on a Sunday or whatever, or a podcast here or there, and it makes them feel a little bit better about themselves. But at the end of the day, it's found lacking. They don't have the real power to overcome sin in their life or bondage in their life. And so these are the things being thrown at this generation. Division, like crazy. There's been a lot of division lately. Wow, it's crazy. Uh, wars happening, all this stuff. So the point is, the version of Christianity that worked maybe 10 years ago for kids just to get by or for young people to get by and still be okay is not going to even be okay anymore. They're going to get taken out, for real. Unless someone will father them. Unless someone will come alongside them. I'm going to read a verse real quick here in Malachi chapter 4. It's a classic verse. Are you guys still with me here this morning? All right. Malachi 4, verse 6. It's the last verses of the Old Testament. It says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes, and he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children, and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. You see in this verse, one of the key ingredients, again, I believe at this time. Fathers and mothers, parents, turning their hearts to the younger, and the younger turning their hearts to the father. It's a two-way street. What does turning of the hearts actually mean? I want to leave three things with you guys here this morning. And I also want to have a, a prayer moment as well. Oh, yeah, we already have the slide up. I want to have a prayer moment as well because I, I want to talk about it. And I believe God's imparting stuff even as I'm talking right now in this moment. But I want to move beyond that. And I want to have a few prayer moments where I think there's some transactions that are supposed to take place in the spirit specifically here this morning. So what does it mean to turn hearts towards one another? <clears throat> one of the things I wrote down was what this generation is looking for 
is they're looking for someone that will be real with them. What does it mean to be real with uh, someone? It means to get in their life enough to know and talk about the difficult things. There's no topic that's off the table. They, they were doing studies for different things, and one of the things they found was Gen Z, the next generation, one of the top things that they're looking for was authenticity. Yes. Authenticity was almost at the top of the list, and, they, and you see this all over the place. Speaking of TikTok, there's things like this actually on there, and this just kind of proves the point. They, it, it's almost like the polished version of things they're repelled by in a lot of ways. Right? You could do a, an amazing fancy promo on TikTok and it does nothing. And then you could do a grainy video of something that's authentic and it goes viral. Yeah. They do this stuff. My nephew was showing me this. It keeps me relevant. I need young people even younger than me in my life. <laughs> I feel outdated, honestly. And he was showing me this. He goes, on TikTok, one of the things that guys do is they go live and sometimes they go live and they show their entire day to people. Have you seen this? Well, they'll like put their phone in their pocket or whatever, and they'll walk around, and people will be tuning in to watch their normal life. <laughs> they even go live while they're sleeping. Seriously, he was showing me this. So they're sleeping, and they have a video on. It's kind of creepy, I know. but And people are literally tuning in because it's live, and anything could happen. It's real. It's not polished. It's not pre-planned. He showed me another video, again, this is a really unique one, of this guy who he covered himself in flour. This is TikTok world right here, guys, okay? Covered himself in flour with his shirt off, and he sat there in a chair for hours, three, four, five, six hours, taking a rubber band at a time, putting it on the watermelon until it finally exploded. I'm not even making this stuff up right now, Okay. People will be tuning in by the thousands watching a man put rubber bands on a watermelon. I'm not even joking. Why do they do that? Because they want the real deal. They want anything could happen. Not saying that's the most important thing in the world. But what I'm saying is anything could happen. It's not polished. It's not this planned out thing. It's something that's unique and it and it addresses something in their life on, a, on that moment, right? And so they want the real deal in their life. So no topics. I want to encourage you guys here, mothers and fathers in the community. No topics are off the table. Okay, when something comes up in a conversation, go there in those conversations. Ask questions. Be present. Pray with them. Journey with them in that category. They want older men and women who are going to be real with them. Amen? Amen. All right. Number two, they want people to believe in them. To believe in them. We need a whole nother generation of Barnabases to be raised up. Barnabas means the son of encouragement. What Barnabas did with Paul, the apostle in the New Testament, was what? He grabbed, he grabbed Paul, who was a murderer. He saw something in him that no one else saw. Again, he saw through his mess. He th saw through his past. He saw through his mistakes. And he saw with the eyes of God who Paul was. Put his arm alongside him and says, come here. I'm going to open up some doors for you. I'm going to introduce you to some people. Everyone else was a little bit skittish, but when he came in, because of Barnabas, his reputation and who he was and his character, they welcomed Paul into their group. And then Paul became Paul the Apostle that we know today, who was probably the greatest missionary and agent of change in that first century of the church. And Barnabas was willing to fade into the background for Paul to go forward. So a true mother and father would come alongside, be the encourager, see with eyes of faith the, the kid you might be discipling or the other young adult you might be discipling. They may be really messed up. They have a lot of issues. 
They're cynical. They may backlash at you, whatever it might be. But can you grab a hold of God's heart for them and see God's eyes, see through God's eyes to see what he sees in them? And would you go even beyond that, put your arm alongside them and actually open up doors for them? Bring them with you to places. Bring them with you into conversations. And that third layer there is even be willing to play the background while they actually become more known. That is the heart of a spiritual mother and father. A mother desires for their kid to step into who God's called them to be and is willing to lay down sleep and sacrifice and all kinds of stuff to see them succeed in that. We need to do that spiritually for those around us as well. Amen? Amen. So we need to believe in them. So we need to be real with them. No conversations left off the table. Like for real, guys. For real. We need to stop saying there's certain subjects that are taboo that we can't talk about as the church. If we don't talk about them and bring truth to them, guess who else is talking about them? Guess who's defining that version for them? That category, they're going to define it the way the world define it, defines it, not because they're even trying to be backslidden, but it's because the church isn't addressing it. They're swiping it under the rug, and they're saying, I don't want to talk about it. That's too touchy for me. But the reality is we need to. Now, I'm not saying we need to address the details of everybody's sin from a pulpit on stage in front of a crowd, right? But at a dinner table, sitting down next to somebody, when you're in their life, talking through those difficult scenarios. And not all of them are a formula. Some of them are complex. Some of them have a lot of baggage attached to them. And they need somebody who's going to talk to them in their specific scenario to bring truth to it. Okay, so to be real with them, number one. Number two, to believe in them. And number three, I want to leave this with you, to be intentional with them. Discipleship happens life on life. I tell our guys this in Kansas City all the time. Programs, though they may be good, don't disciple people. People disciple people. Someone doesn't grow unless they see someone else in their life or they have someone else next to them to grow with them. You could have the best curriculum. You could even have the best podcast you're feeding these people. But unless you're enough in their life to see what's going on, you're not going to see the transformation that Jesus saw with his disciples. Jesus could have done a lot of versions for us when he came to the earth. He could have had a, a massive uh, seminary, which I'm not opposed to seminaries. He could have enrolled all these students, hundreds of thousands of them if he wanted probably. And he just was the teacher from the front. They all were sponges and they just received all this amazing information and soaked it up. And then they go, they went in the world and spread the gospel. He could have done that version, but he didn't do that version. He pulled 12 guys closest to him. He had other guys. There's a 70 and as well, but 12 specifically that he did life with. They knew what foods he liked. They slept next to him with tents, right? He did life with them. And over the course of several years, not weeks, not months, years, they began to step into who God called them to be. It came from life on life relationship. One of the things that it's so easy to slip into in our American culture here is apathy and comfortability. It's so easy, particularly in America and the West, to slip into this is my world, this is my bubble, and you know, we kind of get just get caught in the routine, maybe not even on purpose, but then all of a sudden we're apathetic towards pouring into other people around us. And we've journeyed with the Lord for years, but maybe in that category of our life, we are sitting on the sidelines and we're not in the game. There's this story I was thinking of, and this is a very intense story. So again, I'm not saying this specific example, 
but I think it's an extreme version that will catch your attention. So th there's this guy, he was a missionary in West Papua. He still is. But early on, he was in these unreached tribes. And while he was there, God began to deal with him if he really had lordship fully in his life in some areas. When he first showed up, he had no door on his house, and he never did. So at any moment, he realized, wow, people can literally just walk in my door of my little hut anytime they want. And he's like, I guess that's just the way things are here. He went to take his first shower, and he bathed in the river, and he realized, with his clothes on, and he realized people were watching him as he's bathing. He's like, wow, this is uncomfortable. I literally have no space ever to be just with myself. And he started to resent it, but over time, God began to speak to him. And God began to speak to him and says, actually, you have held on to the right of privacy. And he says, you need to give that right to me. It belongs to me. And so for however many years, it was over a decade, every time he took a shower, it was in the river, someone was watching him. Yeah, that's intense. People could walk into his home at any point while he was there for over 10 years but he laid his life down to reach those people and God moved super powerfully because he was willing to lay down even his quote unquote boundaries of privacy to reach people. Okay, that's an extreme example. Some of you guys are like, I have no idea how that relates to me. It does in the sense that often, and there are healthy versions of boundaries. I'm not saying there's not healthy versions, but what I am saying is, we often put so many boundaries around us that people can't even get to us if they wanted to. We don't realize we have these set up and we need to actually lay them down before Jesus and say, what's your version, God? I, I said, you're my Lord. Even in my comfort zone, I'm going to sacrifice that to you. And I want you to speak in, what do you want me to do? Where we would begin to invite people into our homes, come to our dinner tables, where we would open up our lives. Again, I'm not saying every time, all the time, you need to have people around you. But what I am saying is we need to, again, lay this before the Lord and get his thoughts on it and say, God, what does it look like for me to pour into this next generation? What does it look like for me to invest in people? So I want to have a couple prayer moments here. So right now in this church, there is, if you're thinking about yourself, there's someone here that you could probably pour into. Or there's someone in your neighborhood you could pour into. There's someone in your community you could pour into. There's someone in your family you could pour into. And if you realize you're not really doing that in an intentional way, I would encourage you start with one or two people. Start there. Because I believe, and Brandon and I were talking a little bit about this yesterday, I believe we're actually in a John 4 moment where Jesus was talking to his disciples and he says, don't say the harvest time is three months, six months from now. He says, behold, lift up your eyes for the harvest is plentiful now. I, I, f I feel it especially coming out of this pandemic and looking at stuff all around the world and all these different nations, all these nations have been shook up. America has been shook up. This community has been shook up. And I believe we are on the cusp of a whole bunch of young people coming into the kingdom, like for real. These guys are going to be raw. <laughs> They're going to be all kinds of issues going on. But if we would be willing to come alongside them and journey with them, I believe God's going to use this in a powerful way. So in preparation for that, I want you to even think about that. Even as I'm talking, one or two people that you could mother or father in this season. Okay? And I believe this is preparation for harvest when there's going to be many young people all around. They may not fit in the church box. They may not even come to a Sunday morning. They may, I don't know. 
but where you personally would be connected and pouring into them. So let's just stand. And I want to have, I want to have a couple prayer moments here. And Brandon, if you feel stuff, you can jump in and out too. Going back yesterday to the women's gathering, the women's brunch, and here this morning, I do feel like, again, maybe not every word I'm saying is a thus saith the Lord, but I do feel like this subject, this topic of mothering and fathering is something prophetic for this community this weekend. I feel like it's very significant. You guys have an inheritance as a community to disciple the next generation. They need to be activated in the things that you guys have stewarded for decades. I believe there's, there's some in this church that have been here for years, maybe over a decade, that have been carrying different things. God is highlighting you and saying, this is a season for you to invest, maybe like you've never invested before. So I want to have a <clears throat> first prayer moment here. I want to have, I know ladies had some of their moment yesterday a little bit, but I would love if all the fathers specifically in the house um, would, if we would just pray over them. Um, I was just feeling this as I was preparing. Specifically the fathers, I felt like the Lord wanted to release something over them and unlock something in their hearts here this morning. And so if you're a, a, a father uh, in the house, or if you've been in the faith for, let's say, more than five or 10 years and your father spiritually, um, would you just raise your hand? I know it's gonna be a large group here this morning. So this is what I wanna do. Let's, as people just around these guys, keep your hands up. Let's get around these guys. I know you're a community that loves to pray, loves to prophesy. Um, Let's just, let's come out of our chairs a little bit. Let's find people around if we need. And let's begin to pray over these ones and begin to declare over them and say, you are a father in this community. Begin to receive them and begin to declare what the Lord wants to release and unlock in them in this season. Does that sound good? So let's just get around, keep your hands up and let's make sure every person's covered who has their hand up. And let's just begin to go all together. You guys can just lift up your voices as you find them and begin to pray for them. First, receive them. Say, we receive you as a father in this house. And then begin to just pray and unlock different things in their hearts. Unlock what the Lord wants to do in this season. So just as you're praying over them, I just want you to say, I wanna to repent to you. Just repeat after me as you're praying over the fathers. I wanna to repent to you for any way that I have not honored you, that I haven't welcomed your wisdom or welcomed your advice. I need you. I need you. We need you. We can't go without you. I won't go without you. Would you bless me? Would you pray for me? Would you pour into me? Would you believe in me? Would you champion me? I receive you in this house. Get off the bench. Get off the bench. It's time to coach again. It's time to coach again. We need you. So I just want you now, just pray in your own words, a blessing over them. I want you to bless them. Just begin to bless them and speak life over them that they have what it takes to pour into the next generation. The grace to be intentional, the grace to find time, clarity to know the sons that they're supposed to pour into.
So Father, we bless all the dads in this house, both spiritually and practically. Lord, raise up their spirit. Lord, we break against the spirit of discouragement in Jesus' name. Or maybe you felt you were never invested in yourself. What can I then invest? Father, we thank you that we have a good Father. As you declare, the Holy Spirit will teach you all things. And God, we thank you. There's a fresh impartation to receive the Holy Spirit's leadership in your life. Thank you so much. In Jesus' name. Jonathan's going to pray for one more thing before we close here. Okay, so I want to yeah, have one more quick prayer moment here. If you are under the age specifically of 25, I was feeling 25, um, would you raise your hand real quick in the house? Under the age of 25, okay. All right, raise them up nice and high, nice and high, okay. All right, now I want the rest of us, specifically mothers and fathers, the rest of you guys are mothers and fathers, I'm calling you that. Get around these guys and let's pray and prophesy over them as well, okay? So under 25, raise your hand nice and loud or high and let's get around these ones and let's just, let's begin to be those people of encouragement. Be those ones that say, you know what? This is what God says about you. This is what I believe about you. This is what the Holy Spirit is doing in you and through you. So let's just go for it right now here for just another minute. We just declare over this next generation, you guys pray with me. We just declare that you have a voice, that you are a messenger, that there is a message that you are gonna release to those around you. We declare that you are accepted and that you belong in the family of God. We just declare that you are more than enough, that God has anointed you. I just declare that you walk in a boldness, that the fear of man will not stop you. I just declare that you have a vision and a purpose and a future for your life, that you were made for impact. So we just bless you. My brother Jeff, one of the leaders here, he has a quick word. Uh, I want to share something from my own life, and then I want to speak over that generation. I grew up with a stepfather who was uh, hard. And I remember a specific moment after I graduated college, after I had my career, after I was working. I had dinner with him one day, and he said, you know, I'm proud of you. And it broke me. I was 25 and it was the first time I'd ever heard him say that. So I want to speak to everyone who's in that generation 25. We are proud of you. I tell my daughters, I'm proud of you. I'm proud of how you stand for truth. I'm proud of how you kick against the temptation of the world. You know, Jonathan was talking about the garbage in this world that you're facing and I'm proud of you for standing up to that and saying God I just want to be pure God I just want to be what you've called me to be God I just want to follow you you know I'm proud of you I don't know if I could have stood again oh, let's be let's be honest I didn't stand against it in my time so when you stand against that I'm proud of you listen receive that word we are proud of you. Uh, let's eyes closed real quick. This is, a, this is a word of the Lord. That's a prophetic word. Just close your eyes. I don't care what your age is or gender. You've never felt the affirmation of a father before. And that word right there penetrating something. You've never heard a father say they were proud of you. Lift your hand up if that's you. Jeff, declare that over them. Speak to everyone who has their hand up. We, the fathers in this house, we're proud of you. And most important, your Father in heaven is proud of you. Because you stood for him. Because you've held on. Maybe all you could do was hold on, but that, that's something. That's important. So Father, we receive the affirmation from our dad in heaven who says he loves us. How great is the Father's love for us that he might call us children of God. 
that which we did not deserve, that which we did not earn, that which we did not pay for, you bought for us. So Holy Spirit, we declare your affirmation, your grace over this house. Simone and Jonathan, get in the middle here. Simone, where you at? She's probably running, praying for somebody right now. Let's just extend your hands towards uh, Simone and Jonathan. Simone in the Spirit, because she's praying. Father, we declare grace and blessing over this family. God, we thank you for the nations that they are called to press their feet upon, even with their young children. God, we thank you for the work that you've done through my brother. We declare that grace for miracles in Jesus' name. The Lord, you would take Jonathan into a deeper season of boldness and maturity. I just see the Lord, just like in Isaiah 6, putting that fire coal on your mouth, Jonathan. There's going to be words that he's going to be giving you, and the Lord says, let go of the seatbelt, brother. It's time to unclip the seatbelt because he's going to give you words of authority. I just see you branding others with the mark of the Lord as you were branded at 17. Father, we thank you for the unique ways he stepped out in ministry. We declare financial grace and blessing over Simone and Jonathan that you bless them above and beyond even the miracles they're praying for financially for their base in Kansas City that you would pour out the resources of heaven over my brother that you give him audience with business leaders and developers I just even feel that some of those young men you've been discipling, they're going to they're gonna have a unique affluence in their life. And they're, you're going to see those younger than you expected fund the works of the kingdom that God's called you and Simone to go and reach. So, Father, we bless them, my brother and sister. In Jesus' name we declare, amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Jonathan. We love you, brother.